and we're live now all right we are live welcome everyone good afternoon good evening whatever time zone you're at welcome to another exciting session conversations engagement hearing about the different seagull partners doing incredible work in malawi but even different stakeholders all over malawi where we're talking about interesting issues i know most of you joined us on previous sessions in 2021 but we have more exciting um, sessions in 2022 and Today, it's all about celebrating International Day of Education that's coming up. Um, today's session is really about bringing up awareness on the education system in Malawi, the challenges, but also the innovation. So as your host on today's session, as always, Dikala Itai, founder for Her Liberty, I will be taking you through a session with amazing speakers that we have, where we're going to be talking about innovating the education system of Malawi. As we all know that innovation has been a key thing, especially with the COVID pandemic that has happened. The past two years has been challenging for our education system. When we saw school, schools closing and we saw even inequalities happening where everyone was saying, you know, school has gone online, but you find that other schools don't even have access to ICT, don't even have access to computers. So I don't want to get all into it, but just here's just a snapshot on some of the conversations we'll be having today the challenges as well as the solutions and innovations around dealing with the COVID pandemic but as well as improving our education system in Malawi. So to kick start the session let's first of all get to hear who is in our session today who we're talking to so we'll start off from hearing from our panelists if you could just share with us who you are and uh, a little bit about yourself and your organization. Let's start off from hearing from Patience. Thank you, Dikala. So I'm Patience Campbell from Medit Learning. We're a grassroots organization working um, in Malawi to amplify the learning experience in public primary schools. And what we do is we set up called literacy hubs. And these are spaces that give students access to learning resources, um, remedial reading lessons, digital oh. skills training, and much more. And our belief is that a child who can read and has access to learning resources and um, high 21st century learning resources stands a better chance of making it to secondary school, making it to college and beyond. So that's why we're here to give every student a chance to a world-class education. Thank you. Thank you, Patience. We're excited to learn more about uh, your organization and the work that you're doing as well. I am now going to turn it to Ulanda to give us a brief introduction of who you are and what you're doing. Olanda, you're on mute. Perhaps unmute yourself. I'm Olanda Mtamba, Country Director for Advancing Girls Education in Africa, Age Africa. We are currently operating in the southern region of Malawi. We are providing comprehensive uh, secondary school and tertiary education to need and uh, uh, those uh, brilliant girls who cannot be able to uh, find support to access quality education in Malawi. Um, apart from that, we provide also access to life skills um, programs for secondary school as well as uh, the tertiary student. Apart from being the country director for uh, Age Africa, I'm also a passionate advocate for uh, adolescent girls and young women, focusing much on biomedical HIV prevention. So I fall much on uh, research happening in Malawi, uh, as long as it's to do with uh, HIV prevention, but also globally. So I have two arms uh, or two hats that I put on access to college education, but I also fall a lot on research happening uh, in the area of health, especially uh, biomedical HIV prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Ulanda, and very two important hats. So we'll be looking forward to hearing um, most of your inputs in this discussion as well. And then I'm gonna move on to Marisia from Jacaranda. I am Marie Da Silva, the founder of the Jacaranda School for Orphans. Our model of 
of education is providing free education, nutrition, health, um, arts such as music, dance, poetry, and then we support the children's guardians with uh, entrepreneurship classes and microcredit loans. We have a vocational and a, com and a preschool. Uh, the preschool will be complete and ready. And this vocational and preschool will be a complete of our arc of um, education. Our school, uh, at school, we have a year of service for our students and provide college scholarships. On outreach, we donate libraries in public schools, now reaching over 50,000 children here in Malawi. And we have a Jacaranda Cultural Center where artists from around uh, the country come to showcase their works. This is just some of uh, what we do at Jacaranda, but I'll be able to tell you more about our model of education at Jacaranda and how we involve the students into, um, uh, into being leaders and working in other schools. So that I will bring more into the program today. And that's what we do at Jacaranda. Thank you. Thanks, Marie, and we're looking forward to hearing more about what you what you bring and how other people can even be involved in some of the work that you're doing. And last but not least, we have to wear, we could not be having a conversation about education without having someone from the Ministry of Education. So I'd like to give this opportunity to hear from Tawera to give us an introduction on, on who you are and the department you're working with in the Ministry of Education. Uh, thank you, hosts. I am Doe Ramasoka Banda, um, Chief Education Officer, Lilongwe City Council. Um, mainly, my job is to manage the primary schools uh, that are in Lilongwe City Council. We have um, uh, 55 primary schools, and we have just opened one more to have uh, 56 primary schools. And uh, among these, we have um, uh, two schools, which are uh, one at the prison, Maula Prison and Gajere uh, Model, where our learners, uh, uh, the learners who are, have issues to solve with the, the laws. So uh, we have two schools that we cater for. And uh, only during many exams, uh, we extend to uh, the secondary schools, otherwise, uh, my jurisdiction is the 56 uh, primary schools, managing them, resourcing them, uh, deploying the teachers uh, that the ministry provide this time around in the decentralization system. Uh, we are even mandated to, to employ, uh, promote uh, the teachers within the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Toeran. I hope you, the viewers and everyone else joining this session is really excited to be having this discussion, you know, celebrating International Day of Education. This is a critical conversation we should be having. And um, just to note that most of the partners here, Jack Aranda, Ladders of Learning, Age Africa, they're all part of um, the, in, the social impact incubator. So it's really exciting to be learning from them, especially when it comes to innovation in the education system. So to kickstart this conversation, I want to start off firstly to hear from Toera. You know, you already shared on some of the work that you're doing and the 56 primary schools that you're managing um, within the Ministry of Education. But just to hear from you, you know, we had the COVID pandemic and there had been so many challenges. And just to just touch base and hear from you, perhaps you could share a bit more on how has it been working during the pandemic and especially even managing these primary schools during the COVID pandemic? Tawara, are you there? Okay, you're, you're back on. Uh, I, I don't know. Yes, my network here, my bandwidth is low, so I may be uh, in or out. However, uh, during the COVID-19 as the longest city, we really had a lot of challenges because 
uh, in Lilongwe City, although we have only 55 primary schools, but we have very big uh, enrollments in these schools. For example, uh, last year we had the, uh, some of the schools, the largest school like Shibara Primary School registered 9,700 and something learners, just one school. And the, we have schools, most of the schools, about, about the 31 primary schools uh, are above 2,000 learners per school. And we have uh, 6,000 learners, 5,000 learners. Now, during the COVID-19, this large enrollment was really uh, hectic. However, uh, with the guidance from the Ministry of Education, uh, we managed to do have the classes uh, broken down into 40 learners per class and this called for extra teachers and we were also uh, privileged that we were supported with the uh, EPT 13 teachers who were employed as auxiliary teachers and Lilongwe City is the one which received a good number of these teachers we had 338 teachers uh, total of these auxiliary teachers, which were distributed to the schools with a very high enrollment. Um, also, we were supported uh, with the, um, uh, the sanitation materials, like the buckets, uh, soap. Uh, we were supported with masks. We also were supported with the funds which we used to procure these on our own at the district level. The city council also provided us with the, about 1,000 uh, face masks, uh, cloth face masks, which we also distributed to the, some of the teachers uh, because they couldn't uh, suffice for all the teachers because the wrong way uh, has uh, 2,777 teachers. So the 1,000 masks plus the ones which we procured uh, for each teachers, each, each teacher were, um, uh, distributed to the teachers. Um, at the same time, uh, we also, as a city council, through the ORT, uh, because we had spread the classes, meaning that we had a lot of classes, so we, we procured also uh, the chalkboards uh, for the classes which we are learning outside. Um, so the challenges were, especially during uh, the rainy season, that most of these classes uh, were often disturbed because when it's raining, it means they had to run into the classes uh, to seek shelter and you would find three, four classes uh, cramping into one, uh, one classroom. So it was really hectic. And um, uh, during the, this financial year that we are in, we were given also resources um, which we were using at the district level. And some of these resources we managed to pay the auxiliary teachers and also buy the PPE for uh, for the the teachers uh, in the in our schools. Um, I think I can I can stop there. Yeah. No, Torera. I mean, just hearing about the large enrollment, you know, it's it's so high and. It's scary at the same time because you start thinking to yourself, you know, do we really have the infrastructure, you know, to 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 enroll all these students? Because we've seen a lot of, you know, you were just sharing a bit of those challenges where you're saying that there's so many students in the school, but they're not enough classrooms. I'm even thinking about even school materials, but even the time um, where I'm happy to hear there was so much support to even looking to COVID prevention measures like the masks and the water buckets and so forth. But um, I'll come back to you Tawera, but I'm keen to know more about even the quality of education because I'm sure there may have been even more challenges of like school materials. And even the time where the students were not going to school, you know, I knew lessons we heard lessons went on radio, but I think there was still a gap on other students, you know, who were not even able to continue learning while they were still at home when schools had closed. But yes, I'm going to yes. pause there for now, mm -hmm. um, Torera, mm -hmm. and we'll come back to you just to hear quickly from maybe Age okay. Africa. You know, you you play a role in providing life skills to, to students and maybe to just to share a bit more from um, some of the key challenges that are being there as well um, when it comes to education and even providing key life skill classes during the pandemic. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tikala. As uh, Age Africa, we were really uh, affected by the pandemic, uh, especially uh, during the first and second wave when uh, the schools were closed because delivering the life skills program, we depend much on um, the physical meeting. So um, we create the safe space for the girls where they meet um, at least once a week in their groupings, where they discuss their permanent, uh, permanent issues and uh, by the verge of uh, the closing of the schools, what it meant was that we cannot be able to deliver um, the life skills program because students were back home. And, uh, but still more, the challenges that they normally face, they were facing the very same challenges, um, early marriages and being forced <clears throat> or raped and all that. So as an organization, um, looking at the support that we were supposed to continue providing to the girls, even though they were back home, uh, we, um, we devised our programming uh, by making sure that we still deliver the very same services, but to the home state, which was not easy. So um, as an organization, we were doing some home visits, providing psychosocial support and counseling, and also the distribution of school and learning materials, but also we um, we started delivering the charts program using the different platforms that we can be able um, to to reach out to our um, our scholars. So uh, we started working with the community leaders uh, in in our impact areas, and um, um, we, we we worked on the materials, uh, moving them from the book to a live radio program. So since then, up to now, as Age Africa, we deliver the life skills program, the chats through the radio programs. We're working with four radio programs uh, in the country, including the uh, NBC Radio 2. And uh, we deliver the materials, the same content through uh, radio programs, uh, which we call it Ticheze Atikana. So uh, even though we face the challenges on how we can be able to deliver uh, the same content to, uh, to our scholars, but through the radio programs, we're managing to reach out actually to more girls uh, beyond our impact areas in the Southern region. Now we are able to reach out to more girls nationally and also um, supporting uh, the girls. We are also getting parents being engaged in our programs as well as even boys, so to say, uh, that they're, they're able to listen to the program and also contribute. So you can see that beyond the challenges we saw these uh, innovative ideas and we uh, we used that opportunity uh, to to be able to reach out to our beneficiaries but also to lead that to reach out to more girls who might need the support especially uh, bearing in mind of the challenges that covid-19 just brought uh, on the limelight the issues of school dropouts pregnancies um, girls being uh, uh, married off being made uh, caretakers and breadwinners and all that. So uh, using the uh, digital platform, we have innovated our uh, programming and be able to deliver the same content using um, the current, uh, current available technologies to, to support the girls. Thank you. Thanks, Zulanda. You had started touching on some of the innovations, which is exciting, and we're going to hear more about that. Um, but so interesting to just hear about just, you know, having to think through the challenges that we're going on in terms of, you know, how do we reach the students because they're not coming to school. And I think that had been one of the key challenges that a lot of people had had shared to say, how do we reach these students to continue learning or to continue having just like crucial like you know, sessions or you know these most of these other youth club sessions they used to have after school as well so there's so many issues that were happening around just reaching students themselves and being able to reach all students was a challenge I think there've been a lot of inequalities that a lot of people have reported to say some students were being reached to continue learning while others were still stuck at home with no material no access to any learning or radio um, but Let's hear more from, um, I'm going to move on to Marie. I know, Jacaranda, you do quite a lot within your own school program. And just to be keen to hear more from you in terms of what have been your challenges and, you know, just even your perspective on the status quo of um, the education system in Malawi with um, during the pandemic. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. 
um, we, we, we had some challenges and our challenges were quite, quite vast because um, Jacaranda um, is funding literally comes from donors, um, me going and knocking on people's doors to, to find funds to uh, keep the school going. So in this case, there were things like, maybe I'll just go a little bit back to our kids, the place where when I introduced myself, I said, we provide education, nutrition, medical health. So when it came to first the food, because this is where they get the two uh, porridge uh, a day, uh, we had to then try to think how, because we are not supposed to have the kids in school. This is the only place where they come to eat. So now we had to send the food into their homes. So we had to bring up a program where we brought the uh, guardians into the school once a week and we divided it from classes. And during this food distribution, where we gave like 5 kg of uh, the Likuni Pala to a, a, a family, and we knew this is gonna be so difficult because the family now has to feed the whole family, not only our school kids. But during that program, we then educated the guardians too about the pandemic. So at the same time, we started teaching them, they would come to pick the food, but we'd have then people talk to them while they're social distancing about the mask wearing, about what we're gonna do about the lessons now. So for the lessons, as um, you know, our, our kids are all orphans. So there is no way that most of the houses have electricity or maybe have uh, access to a computer or a laptop. So there was no way we could have put stuff on a uh, uh, thing through um, uh, uh, online. So what we did is we then got the teachers to prepare lessons and the teachers left these lessons in our outside library. And then the kids would come and pick it and take it home and then bring it back. So it was done class after class, would bring it back. The teachers would take it, correct it. But we had to tell the parents what was going on. So we had to then think of both two, the parent and the children. We're educating both of them. And it worked, surprisingly, it worked. The kids did their lessons, they brought it back because we had told the parents, this is very important that you do that. If we see that you guys have not been doing this, when you come to pick up your next pala, you need to explain to us why your children were not doing this. At the same time, what we did is we, I, I, I put a GoFundMe page straight away because that's the way we are receiving our funding. Usually during the year, people are coming and visiting us and stuff. Now it had stopped for the seven months or eight months that school was closed, it, it had stopped. So I put a GoFundMe page where I explained to the people about the difficulties of us a, acquiring ma masks, which we had to make and stuff like that. So then the GoFundMe page was amazing. We, are, we raised so much of money that then enabled us to, to keep the school going out of school, but working well. Um, now on our girls, because our girls uh, at Jacaranda, we have thankfully more girls than boys. We have our system, how we work with, more, we have 400 students right now. So we have got more girls, top girls in class. The biggest leaders are the girls in class. But what we do is that we have constant, constant um, mentoring of the girls. Uh, the empowerment class, we have the Kafunga class, what we call the girls Kafunga uh, uh, program after school, they all come together. And uh, we have a group of the guardians and like the chief's uh, sister who comes and talks to the girls about the importance of staying in school, about not getting pregnant early, about uh, uh, um, sexual abuse, everything. So what we did was these same people who do this at the school, we're then going into the village to these girls' houses to make sure they're staying home. They're not walking in the village. They're not staying out late at night just because school is not on. So we were very lucky that we had a very limited number of pregnancies. I think within this whole seven months, we had two girls pregnant. And those two girls were the girls whom even before school we had to hold on to because they were always we'd hear that this was it was in the village last night so that we were not surprised at these girls now that they've been left free there's no school there's no place to come to they would do this so yes it was a challenge but i must say that we managed to at the end when 
even when school came back, or when all the students came back, we got back into that same routine that we had even before COVID. Like until today, you'll see them wearing masks. They'll wash their hands before they go into class. We have the buckets of water outside the class. So what COVID has, has uh, what COVID was, it's still continuing that we're keeping the measures, we're keeping them understanding that education is important. Whether you are staying at home for eight months or you're in class, you will still learn, we will get you. We are coming there, we'll give you the lessons. So that's how it happened at Jacaranda. And I must say, we cannot complain. Um, we did have a success, but it was tough. Wow, Marie, I think just even hearing the fact that you had 400 students and having to think through bringing in their guardians and the feeding program and all the different pieces and also still ensuring girls, you know, um, don't get themselves into, you know, behaviors that will be a, a, a way that will be a barrier to continue their education. It's, it's incredible how you had to think through that and get funding to keep supporting um, all the initiatives you had to get into during the pandemic. So really, really interesting to you. And we're going to learn more about just these innovative um, programs and, and activities that you had to do. Uh, but I want to move on to patience, ladders of learning, la ladders to learning, sorry, um, just to, to hear more about what you had to do. How did you deal during the, the pandemic and what have been some of your challenges? Thanks, Tikala. Um, so interesting to hear from everyone. And, um, you know, COVID did bring its share of challenges, um, as everyone has said. And for us, we had, we set up literacy hubs. So um, the literacy hub is open to the whole student population. Kids can come in and borrow books and read and ask for help, um, get some computer training. So when the schools shut down, it was like, now what? because the schools are closed, what are we going to do with, with our students? And especially students um, that I enrolled in our remedial reading program, because these are students that have fallen behind in their reading when they need extra help. So uh, the first thing we did was have what we called educational phone call chats with our students, just to keep in touch and make sure that they know that we're there for them and that we want them to continue to learn, check up on their parents. There was a radio program that the government was running. So we'll um, tell them the schedule and what time to turn on the radio and get to listen in whilst we're looking for other solutions. And uh, fortunately for us, we, we were looking for funding for um, a COVID response, uh, a COVID response kind of project. And we got that from, um, the Hilton Foundation through the Siegel Family Foundation. Um, and it was a collaborative um, project. So we worked with Jacaranda, um, that's Marie's organization. We worked with um, Center for Youth and Development, uh, Found for Nations and Rays of Hope. And uh, what we were doing is providing um, workbooks for students so that they could access them, whether in school or out of school. So um, we did that as a, as a group, as a cluster, uh, reaching out to over 3,000 students and it helped greatly keep the kids' um, minds on school and um, just have them still interested in learning. And we had our, we had volunteers, um, we recruited volunteers to make phone calls and go through the workbooks with them and go through the, the, the curriculum. Raise of Hope did a really good job because they're the ones who uh, authored these, um, these workbooks for the students and, and um, the manuals for the, for the volunteers who were teachers. And our work is centered around um, supporting public primary schools. So we pretty much support Tawera's work. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to know Tawera, we work together. And um, what we did then next was look at the student holistically because we're saying we're in the COVID pandemic and our students are affected, at, uh, they're not in school and um, they need help. Obviously things are difficult at home, people are losing jobs. Um, their parents, most of them come from low income families. So they should be uh, challenges of which we did find out that most people had lost their jobs, that businesses had gone down, some had to operate from home. Um, and most of them were also women led households. So um, we were fortunate again to get um, funding from uh, Hilton Foundation. Um, and we worked together with uh, an organization called Give Directly and other organizations as well to provide support to students' households. Um, so here we are um, trying to reach out to students that were in our program 
Um, and this was over 450 students. So we're reaching out to their households um, and providing, uh, providing funds for the parents to use for household needs, as well as school needs. So uh, parents use these funds to buy textbooks, to buy notebooks, um, and to just buy school materials on top of the regular things like food um, to support their students. And we had a lot of testimonies saying this was really helpful. It went on for about three months and we really saw um, parents coming in to thank us for coming in during this difficult time to help them out. Um, we had another project also that really focused on um, resourcing students also at home on top of um, working with their parents. And here we bought textbooks for 200 students and we gave them um, one to one remedial reading lessons and also help with their numeracy skills and um, what this we called the homeschool project so kids had to they had access to take textbooks home um, and the homeschool project also inspired a textbook fundraiser campaign uh, which happened uh, around May um, we, we had another one in October where we raised together um, textbooks for over 700 students and Tawera is, is aware about this um, and so this you know, the COVID pandemic opened up our eyes to what do we do um, when schools close? How do we operate outside of the school infrastructure to help our students continue to learn and to keep them uh, engaged and interested in uh, staying in school and, and continuing to learn? So um, I think I'll pause there for now. I see uh, Victoria has a hand up. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, very, very interesting to see just the work that has been going on just to really deal with the pandemic and just different organizations coming together as well to work together to address some of these key issues. And, and I think that collaborative effort is so key as well. And um, Tawara, just to hear more from you, you know, one thing that I keep thinking about is the the existing inequalities, but also the root issues that we have in our Malawi education system. When are we going to get to the point where we actually address the fact that if 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 every child in Malawi had access to a computer, online learning would have been so much easier. You know, you wouldn't have to be thinking, oh my gosh, we need to get textbooks to every child and every household to keep learning. But imagine if we had, you know, every child had a computer and they knew how to use a computer and were able to access their learning through that, you know? Um, I'm also thinking about just the inequalities of just like the issue of water and sanitation. You know, most of these schools needed to have, you know, um, Tawara was talking about they had donations of buckets to be washing their hands, but I'm thinking, when are we gonna get to the point where our education system has got proper toilets and running water to keep, you know, to sustain this? So, I mean, I'm keen to hear from Tawera, you know, what your thoughts are going forward in terms of how do we really truly get to a point where we do have um, proper ICT systems in our education system, even proper infrastructure when it comes to water and sanitation in most of these government schools as well. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not quite sure if I may, I may be able to answer uh, properly the question on computers. Uh, what I know is the Ministry of Education is trying, is trying when I'm saying Ministry of Education is trying. I really mean it because this time around, we even have a fully fledged department looking into technology. Ministry of Education would like to go that direction so that every learner should have uh, a computer, should have access to a computer. But you know the challenges that we have with this high enrollment, uh, lack of resources. Even this time around, we are not able to suffice on the resources, textbooks. We don't have enough textbooks. And the, the, the other teaching and learning materials are also scarce because of uh, the resources that we, uh, we, we, we get. There are few. You know, no, the resources are centrally uh, directed to the schools at a different level. 
Uh, so um, it would be very, very difficult to answer uh, uh, specifically only when we can really have every learner in the primary school getting a, a computer because the gadgets themselves, they are also expensive. Um, in some areas, we don't have uh, electricity learners coming from homes where they have no electricity and uh, all those challenges. Um, it, it may become very, very difficult to, to reach a point where every learner in Malawi has a a, a computer, let alone even in the city, because even in the city we have uh, vulnerable learners, learners coming from poor families who cannot even uh, afford, parents cannot even afford a phone. Uh, you know, when we were trying to bring in the radio, uh, listening for the lessons by learners, we, the Ministry of Education supported the schools with these uh, radios. Uh, which were basically given to the most vulnerable learners. But then you would find out that in some areas, the, 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 the radio uh, receptions were not even up to date. And even following up on who, which learners were really um, accessing the lessons on the radio, it becomes also difficult because we only relied on parents helping the learners or giving the time to the learners uh, to listen to the radio. And even the time that was allocated for the learners to be uh, listening to the radios was not enough. Uh, basically, it wasn't enough because not all subjects uh, were being offered. So. Um, as far as I know, as I've already said, the Minister of Education would be very happy to have a day uh, when learners will be able to access uh, the computer. Of course, I know we have um, some um, organizations which are helping us, for example, VSO. Uh, is supporting us. We have unlocking talent in the, in some zones, in some schools. For example, at Ibiwi uh, Primary School, we have unlocking talent. And these um, are being supported uh, with the tablets. And we really appreciate their efforts because we have seen that learners in such schools, they are really, really doing well uh, as far as those lessons which are on those tabs are concerned. Uh, now coming to water and sanitation. Uh, this again is another concern uh, with the uh, Ministry of Education and in particular, uh, Lilongwe, uh, Lilongwe City Council. Um, the, the, the major challenge that we are having now when we are, we are talking of uh, buckets is that uh, we, are running, we are trying to run away from uh, uh, using the running water because of the bills. Uh, we know we have uh, Ministry of Education gives us as the longest city uh, some monies that we pay for the, the, the bills, especially the water bills every month, but these are not enough and the schools have to get uh, money from parents so that they can add only whatever they are paying for their water and sanitation um, requirements. Um, I, would, I would also like to say, uh, uh, there is also the Water Harvesting Association that has done a, a, a good job. It has installed the uh, water harvesting tanks uh, in some of our schools. I would, I would cite um, uh, like at Tsokankanasi, we have the tank which has been built. And the, this time around those schools which have accessed those, they are really um, uh, enjoying the abundance of the waters with the rains that are coming. And that is uh, the way to go. That is the way we want, we like uh, eventually to have all the schools have uh, running water. And then we also want to, uh, to have all the schools have the, uh, have to be harvesting the water. So that during, it means during the rainy season, we will be reducing uh, the bills to be paid, which we can keep that money. And then during the dry season, would be able to make sure that uh, those are really um, helping us. At the same time, we we'll also look at, you know, some most of the schools in Nidilonga had them uh, uh, flush toilets. They had water uh, sources, uh, running water sources, but vandalism, you know, in Malawi, our, our, our behavior of vandalizing government resources is a, a very big challenge. Uh, the toilets would be stolen, um, the taps would be removed. So the schools, we are having a lot of uh, challenges to maintain and, and, and replace, especially replacing uh, uh, these toilets. 
time around, we are thinking that when we uh, we'll construct new uh, 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 toilets with the running water, we we'll, we'll put the security of having the bagger, the bars uh, securing, especially the, the, the water tank itself secure it with the, the bar grabbers so that nobody can come and, and remove. For example, I'll give a very good example of Lilongwelea. They had a, 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 the whole uh, building of toilets, but all of them were closed uh, because of these uh, challenges. Uh, of course, we, we have assessed it thinking of how, how, how best we can use uh, the, the, the few resources and maybe uh, maintain them, uh, especially with the, at the wake of COVID-19, we thought we may look at it again and maybe lobby for resources so that we can maintain these toilets. But the schools now are running away from uh, the systems. They would like to have pit latrines um, simply because of uh, the challenges of the water. And the, some schools had installed uh, boreholes. Uh, all that uh, was trying to reduce the water bills. Of course, the learners were advised that the, these boreholes, the water from the boreholes, may not uh, may not be used for drinking. So they would have the taps. Uh, for drinking, and then they would have the water from the boreholes for washing of the hands and the and the other activities. So really, even wow. as Lilongwe City, as Lilongwe City would like to see a day when all the schools in Lilongwe City have uh, water uh, toilets, water systems, and then we also look at. Uh, uh, having enough resources to even uh, maintain the views that are, are, are there. Um, we have That's a strategy, a which is... Uh, Tora. Tora, I'm just going to just stop you there. A, a, a strategy, a new strategy. I'm just uh -huh, going to stop okay. you there for a minute because, you know, you touched on some key issues and I don't want to lose that, that moment where the, you brought up some key issues uh -huh. and some key uh, um, where we get to hear from the others. But, you know, uh -huh. you really touched on critical issues in terms of resources. You know, Malawi just does okay. not have sufficient resources to ensure that we have one, the right infrastructure, right, for the technology as you shared, but as even as well as the, the issue of running water. So it really makes you think, but then I guess also to challenge even other things, the other speakers that are gonna come on in, in our panel today is that you find that why is it that, you know, in the private sector, the private schools, um, you know, they have all these systems, they have the running water, there's no vandalism, they, and then you have the public schools, they just don't have this. And I think mm -hmm. it's such a, a wake up call to the inequalities, but I think it also is an opportunity for us to start rethinking how do we innovate the public and government schools in a way that with the resources we have, how can we begin to put in systems that can work for the government public schools? So I'm going to stop there to just challenge others. But Marie, you had your Marie, you had your name um, and your hand up for a while. So I'll start off with you and then we'll move on to patients. Thank you. Okay, um, my internet has been on and off a little bit, but I'm fine. Um, so just to Madam Toela, uh, I put up my hand when she was talking about the computers in the schools and I totally understand you cannot equip a, a, a whole school, even for us at Jacaranda regardless of the funds, we cannot give everybody a computer. But the important thing is the teachers. I think that in government schools, the teachers should be given access to a laptop. At least let's start with the teachers because that really helps them a lot in preparing school examinations, preparing school lessons, and a lot more because we've seen that all the schools that we've been going to, 22 schools now, where we're putting libraries in, they don't have computers. And then we have to give them a laptop so that they can uh, use it in uh, for their uh, library program. Um, that's very quickly on that. Number two was that the water. The water in the schools, of course, is the water bills and it's really expensive and I'm talking about the uh, uh, public schools because we are surrounded by Chigumula, Misesa school and right now we have not had water for five days but we are getting our water from Misesa school which is a public school because they have the Njigo there, they have the water pump 
and there's always water at Misesa. So do all the public schools in Malawi have the water pump, the Njigo? Because that they can use for, for a lot of things rather than us thinking so much first of how can we provide water for the, you know, make water accessible for everyone else. Let's go, because with Jakaranda, we find that we go to the simplest of things, the most dire things like the Njigo, the water pump, you put it there in each and every school, you give a teacher a computer instead of worrying about each and every student in the school, but give the teacher and then we grow up from there a step at a time. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs> Marie, one step at a time indeed. I mean, these issues are so vast. And then I think currently with the issues of resources, we just don't have enough resources to make sure that, you know, we critically meet all the needs that are there. But I love your thinking in terms of like, you know, one step at a time, seeing who we can reach first and, and then take it from there. Um, I know we've had other innovative initiatives like the windmills and the solar water system also coming up um, and hope, but they all require resources, right? But <laughs> let's see how things go going forward. I think we'll all love to see more donors, especially even our government itself, prioritizing more on these critical needs in the education system as well. Uh, but moving on to you, Patience. Yeah, thanks, Tekala. So I, I really also wanted to just talk about this issue of computers and having every student access one. It's very important. Um, and it's something that we've seen, especially with COVID, that we need the tech side of things. I mean, this is the 21st century. Um, and for teachers to access computers is very important. And we're hoping that we can get enough support for organizations like ours to support teachers um, to you know, have access to computers. We as Ladder to Learning have what we call the online mentorship program that we're running with Village Book Builders. So uh, mentors from all around the world get to mentor students after school. And with the current schedule, um, one computer serves 10 students. So now we have about 25 students enrolled and we're looking to scale this. And I'm actually looking to, you know, talking to Maria about this and how we can have this in, in, in you know, all the schools, even in Blanchard, the 22 libraries, because we really need our students to embrace technology and be, you know, um, tech savvy in this age. It really helps them to grow and it gives them a chance to be at par, you know, with the counterparts in, in private schools. And I also wanted to comment on, um, you talked about, uh, you know, mindset um, and how we can bring about, you know, this, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about bringing about, you know, uh, a culture where we take care of the little that we have because we have so little and um, we hear about mindset change from Malawi 2063, the vision for 2063 and one of the enablers there is mindset change where we're working with our students for us as Latitude to learning we're working to setting up clubs where we can help our students understand that you know if you have a one colored pencil you take care of it so the next student can use it again next time so now we have textbooks people have donated funds towards the textbooks and we let the kids use them for a whole academic year and then at the uh, third term they return the books so that the next class can get to use them it's a way of us teaching our kids to take care of the little that we have so that we can have you know, sustainability, we can sustain our resources and maybe give a chance to those that are gonna come after us. So I'm really hoping we can work more collaboratively to bring more resources into our schools. Thank you. Thanks, patience. And I, and I love that, you know, doing the most of the little that we have as well is so key. And even when we're looking at mindset shift, you know, you're also thinking about that behavior change program. And it's so nice that, you know, um, your organization ladders to, to learning is looking into that. And I think that's, you know, touching on to also what Tawera was saying earlier on saying the issue of vandalism, you know, how do we begin to even educate communities to say why this is important? Why do we have toilets in the schools and why it's important and how we can work together to take care of that and so forth. So I think really you touched on a key thing on that mindset shift and the behavior change and really educating these communities about sustainability as well and why we have these 
key resources in our school system and how we need to preserve them as well. So really good points there. And I, I'm going to move on to uh, hearing from what's happening with Age Africa. I'm sure you've heard some of the innovation that's coming up, but just get your perspective on the inequalities that are out there and what can we do as Malawi uh, innovatively to address some of these key challenges and the inequalities that keep persisting. Thank you very much. Um, we've uh, learned a lot from uh, all the speakers and to emphasize more, uh, to focus much on the inequalities that uh, the pandemic really uh, brought to us. I think one of the major uh, inequality that we've all seen is the uh, digital divide or those that uh, were to do, you could see them doing online learning and uh, uh, using different gadgets and all that, whilst those that are in public schools, they couldn't just afford even a single device to use. And furthermore, to say that connectivity, it's also very expensive in Malawi. And we think of the issues of electricity. We, we can't talk about all these devices and gadgets without uh, uh, talking about electricity, which we know in most rural areas, we don't have uh, um, the students or even our communities do not have access to um, electricity. So there was that kind of uh, digital divide that we saw uh, uh, posing a threat to uh, the education sector. And uh, furthermore, uh, in terms of uh, the gender inequalities, uh, there were so much uh, inequalities when you look at the boy child, a girl child, in terms of the access to the devices, as well as um, also in terms of uh, having free time, you'd see maybe more boys having free time to study and uh, to join uh, colleagues and all that, whilst the girl child was forced to be at home to do the household, uh, the household activities and maybe taking care of the siblings and all that. As we all know that in our communities, in our society, the girl child is protected. You have to be at home and make sure that you're supporting your mom uh, from morning up to evening. By the time it's evening, you find that the child does not have much time even to study or to do some physical activities and all that. So there were all those inequalities that we saw. And uh, a girl child was also forced to be more or less like a parent. You know, uh, in the areas where we're working at Age Africa, Machinga, Mango, Chimulanji, we saw a lot of girls doing a lot of merchants, selling uh, tomatoes, selling donuts and all that, just to have resources for the family, um, unlike the boy child. So we also had like a quick assessment where we uh, identify all those inequalities that were existing during uh, the pandemic. And in so doing, we saw a girl child more having challenges, not having enough, enough uh, uh, gadgets to use to study, not having enough time uh, for herself, being forced to be a parent, being forced to be a breadwinner, and uh, the issues of gender uh, based viruses existing in the homes. You know, most of the girls, um, when you talk of uh, 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 gender based viruses, especially domestic, um, when they go to school, especially those that go to boarding schools or just spending more hours at school, they are protected from uh, those uh, uh, men or boys that uh, victimize them. So during these uh, pandemics, we saw a lot of girls uh, facing a lot of gender based viruses, sexual virus, and all that. So there were a lot of uh, uh, inequalities that existed. And um, I'm afraid that the long term impact will be seeing them now and then the pregnancies coming in, girls dropping out of school, and others losing interest completely uh, for education because they stayed longer and they feel like they cannot just go back to school and the parents have lost hope, they just married them off. So you find there were all those inequalities that existed and they might have long, long-term uh, effects that we need more innovative ways. I know would, um, the take homes could be, what, what is it that we're doing or we'll be doing with the readmission policy? We have the policy, can we enforce that? Can we hold each other accountable so that we make sure that all those girls and boys that drop out of school during the pandemic, they're back in class. Do yeah. they need support in terms of funding, scholarships, books, or just moral support to yeah. ensure that they can be back to school? So there's a lot that we can do as institutions, as families, as big sisters and uh, big brothers, just to make sure that our education system should not collapse because of the pandemic. 
This is not the first pandemic we're seeing. We could see more pandemics and we need to be vigilant. Patients already said about the mindset. Let's focus. Yes, I know Toweira explained about um, the, the, the digital literacy and what the government is doing, trying here and there. Yes, we cannot stop because this is not the first pandemic that we see. We might see more. Let's think of the uh, natural disasters, floods and all that, that students cannot go to school. What will be happening there? So we still need to keep on having innovations like the uh, um, uh, innovations where tablets can have uh, content, school uh, content, and make sure that if a, a girl child or a boy child, they're at home for two weeks because there are some floods, they can read the materials, you know? So innovation should not stop. Our mindset yeah. has to change because we have to move forward if we are to transform the education system. Olanda, such a good point, such a, such a good point that, you know, we are even going through even more issues happening, even with the floods, as you're talking about, that innovation becomes such a critical thing that we need to be thinking about. And the fact that you even touched on the policy, the school readmission policy, what is happening to all those that have dropped out of school, whether it's because of teenage pregnancy or all any other issues, how do we bring them back to the school system? So critical issues that even those watching, we need to be thinking about. So I'm looking at the time and we only have three minutes left. And um, what I need to do, I have a question that was sent to me and I don't know if there are any other key questions. Um, Tia Mike, can you just check if there's any other questions from those watching? So maybe we can use the last two minutes of um, our speakers today to answer some of those questions as we wrap up. Are there any questions from your side, Tia? Um, no, currently no one has asked any question, but uh, you can go first. If anybody comes up, I'll give you a shot. Okay, so in our last three minutes, I had one question that came in from someone from Andiamo organization and they were they doing some work around education and they had a question to us to say that, you know, they have a computer lab, but they always have had issues of getting computers and they're asking who can they talk to to get decent desktop computers for ICT and general educational programs. So any panelists can answer that as they wrap off. So what is going to happen now is each speaker has got about 30 seconds. I know it's very short. <laughs> Just to say one key thing on what they look forward to in terms of innovating the Malawi education system. And that's all you're answering. And then whoever has an answer to this question on who people can reach out to if they wanted to get computers in their school programs. Cool, I'll give it over to you. Let's start off with Marie. Okay, so on the computers, um, we usually, when we bring uh, containers, we always ask for computers. And recently we just got so many computers. Unfortunately, at this, at this time, the gentleman or lady who has asked for the computers, we have already uh, given out, not for us, because at our school, we have a, a complete lapse but we've given them out. And the ones that are remaining, we're donating to prisons because we do outreach in prisons and, and other schools too. But if the person can give us their um, uh, contact uh, address next time we have uh, some, uh, um, a container coming in, I will then look to see how we can help. At the moment, I could say to this gentleman for your computer lab, I can donate two because we have two that are remaining. We've already given out to um, we've already given out to the prison ones are already accounted for, but we have two remaining, and these are desktops. So if they can get in touch with me, I can donate those two into the computer lab wherever they are. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing news. And I think even um, very encouraging for the person who even bring, brought up that comment and question and to even have an opportunity to hear that, Mary. I think, thank you so much. And I will definitely connect you um, to the person who sent me the message. And I think they're online, so I'm sure they'll also reach out to you. Um, so good way to, as we end off the session, uh, patience, your last words for um, our discussion today. All right. So I'll be reaching out to you too, Marie, for- uh, Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I, it's been a very, very insightful conversation. Great to hear what everyone's been up to. And I think um, one, one key thing I've seen to um, reaching our vision or reaching our goals is collaboration. Um, I've talked about the different uh, organizations that we worked with during COVID and no, it was not easy, but yes, it was totally worth it. And we've seen the impact that collaboration has. And I think tweaking our models and being flexible to um, our environment and what changes are coming up is what's going to help us. So I'm really looking forward to collaboration and also support. Um, we've been very fortunate to have received support from different organizations like Hilton Foundation, Single Family Foundation, Think Malawi, World Connect. Um, I can't mention them all, but that's what has kept us going as organizations working at the grassroots. And, you know, we have this paradigm shift where people are realizing that the change makers are at, at the grassroots because we're the ones that are seeing the challenges that um, our communities are facing. So um, support and funding for our different programs and projects is really what we need together with the collaboration um, for us to reach our, our desired goals. Thank you. Thanks, patient. Key word there, hashtag collaboration. So key to, to ensuring that we are improving the education system in Malawi. Uh, moving on to Tawera, your last few words. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I want to build on a, the collaboration issue. Uh, in Malawi, we have so many NGOs and other organizations that are helping in the education system. If we could have a coordinated uh, stand, we would be able to share the resources uh, well, evenly among all uh, those that are in need. And for um, innovations, for example, in the Longwe Urban and the Longwe City Council, we are starting with the procurement of um, computers in the this uh, coming financial year for all the BEs, primary education advisors, because they do not also, they don't have. So we have asked them to budget for that and then we'll be trickling down to the, starting with the head teachers, maybe the center head teachers, until at a time when we can support even uh, the teachers. So we are really going in that direction. And the, we would also like to be responding to some of these issues at the district level. That's why we were even able to procure 120 uh, portable joke boards as an emergency uh, when we split our classes and we saw that the, 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 the teachers did not have anywhere uh, to write. So innovation is really another uh, area to lead it up on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Torera, and just thank you for even making time to be on this session as well. I think it was so key to hear a perspective of someone who's working in, um, at, at, at the level with the Ministry of Education. So definitely hoping to see more collaboration and coordination with even your office with key civil society organizations and, and donors within Malawi. And lastly, Ulanda, your Wait, last one. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tikala. Um, the first, I think uh, the support for computers, um, I think I will share the, their contact to you so that you can provide to him whoever send the question. The, we have the computers for Malawi. They normally uh, get some containers for computers that they can be able, NGOs are able to access, as well as schools. We have for had um, installed CDSS in Zomba, uh, uh, stopped by, um, their lab was stopped by computers for Malawi. So I know the support. Um, in terms of um, one key point that uh, I would want our listeners to take home, it's um, the innovation should not stop. We should continue being so innovative because we are living in um, the global village. Things are changing and we have to move with the pace that our colleagues globally are moving. So innovation technology should be take, uh, took on board in terms of when we are innovating our programs. We should not skip that. Um, funding, it's a great issue uh, for small grassroots organization especially those that really touch the work on the ground. Uh, we are here, we support um, the needy because we understand more on what they're going through. So funding has always been an issue, but we also have to make sure that we focus on the little that we have and be able to deliver. Collaboration, networking, and also learning. We should continue to have the space for learning. It helps a lot for uh, civil society to share what are the best practices 
for learning and as well as improving our programming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alanda, and thank you to all the speakers that we had in our discussions. There are some few questions that came up. So to the speakers, if you have time to just at the end of the session, just you know, respond to some of the messages that, that came up. Um, but ones were related to about just um, programs around the computers. Uh, I see there was a comment about some of the strategies the ministry has adopted to give all students access to computers. I'm sure uh, you probably didn't miss the answer there, but Torera had shared about, you know, ministry's efforts around trying to get computers, but it's all, a, it's all been about access to resources. There isn't enough resources in Malawi to get computers all out there, but there are efforts being done, which were shared by most of the organizations here. But in all in all, thank you to all our amazing speakers and all the best to all the work that you're doing. Um, we'll definitely share contacts of the people who contacted about where they can reach out to get a computer. Thank you, Marie, for that donation as well. And Orlando just mentioning as well, also a contact to get more computers to other institutions, organizations that work in providing ICT to learners. In that, thank you everyone. Enjoy your weekend and I hope you've enjoyed the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Thank you. Thanks.